Garden of the Gods is a tremendous asset to Colorado Springs. No one would believe this is a city park because cities don't have these kinds of parks. Garden of the Gods is God's Disneyland. It's just beautiful. You stand out there among these huge rocks. It's such a gorgeous place. The park came to, to prominence locally when Charles Elliot Perkins gave the 400 and some acres to the people of the world that would be forever free. And since that day, this has become a very prized possession for our city and something that has always deserved attention. This program was funded by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library and History Colorado with additional funding and support from these fine organizations. And viewers like you, thank you. Oftentimes when, you know, when I'm driving to work in the morning, the first two things that capture the morning light is Pikes Peak and Garden of the Gods. So as the sun's coming up, Pikes Peak will be lit up purple, just like right out of America the Beautiful. That's when you get the rocks really red, during that about seven minutes that it takes to come down. European cities may have uh, cathedrals, you know, you go, to the ancient world and you can find the Parthenon, we have Garden of the Gods. Garden of the Gods is in many ways our architecture. It's what attracts people here. We have places like Red Rocks Amphitheater is a Denver city park. Garden of the Gods is a Colorado Springs city park. The Flatirons are a Boulder city park. These beautiful pieces of scenery and landscape that we can all enjoy are controlled not by the federal government, not by private interests, but by our local communities, which means they belong to us in many ways. It fascinates people. People still love to look at the rock formations, to name the rock formations, to compare them to things they know in life. They speak to our imaginations in, in such poetic and lyrical ways that we end up giving the formations these wonderfully mystical names. The Three Graces, the Cathedral Spires, the Kissing Camels, the Balanced Rock, the Steamboat Rock. The Kissing Camels is so much fun because you can see it from so far, it's so easy. But it's not as easy to see as some people think. And after my father built the Garden of the Gods Club, he got a used army surplus um, spotlight and put the searchlight from up on the mesa across just on the Kissing Camels. My favorite rock formation in Garden of the Gods is the Three Graces. I like there being a somewhat spiritual, somewhat elegant, somewhat feminine name for the rocks that look especially pretty. These are just rock formations. They have no feelings for us. But as human beings, we're so quick to ascribe our own emotional state onto the landscape we live in. And the Garden of the Gods really really is tolerant of that. It allows for that in, in a fantastic way. The Garden of the Gods is God's Disneyland. It's just beautiful. You stand out there among these huge rocks, uh, e even when there's 500 people out there that day, you just kind of forget that they exist. If you want to know about geology, Colorado Springs has it exposed. It's peeled off and it's right there and you can learn about it. You can understand what creates the, the beauties that we have. The Garden of the Gods is the product of hundreds of millions of years of geologic forces, of an uplift of an ancestral range of Rocky Mountains and its gradual erosion back down into sand. And then the uplift of our own Rocky Mountains beginning about 65 million years ago, which pushed those flat sand beds up 
into these strange, unworldly, canted positions that we see today. The geologic story of Garden of the Gods is all about erosion, the change in landforms. You have to understand that the Garden of the Gods depicts millions and millions and millions of years of our natural environment. And the changes that you can see there, uh, you know, are documented and hardened in rock. Somewhere around 70 million years ago and older, this was an inland sea. And so very different environment. You can see evidence in the fossils that can be found in Garden of the Gods. It's really a unique natural setting. It is the furthest north that plants that come from the south grow. It's the furthest south that plants from the north grow. It's the furthest down that the montane plants that are up on the alpine come. And it's the furthest up that the prairie plants grow. So it is a crossroads of ecosystems. It must have been a shock to the first American Indians who made their way down the front range of the Rocky Mountains to find these unlikely sandstone formations, these monoliths and, and hog packs and walls and plinths and unlikely balanced rocks that are hanging on the fringe between the mountains and the plains. The different cultures that called this region home, and there are many, the Comanche, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and the Ute, uh, along with many others, there's evidence of human occupation dating back uh, several thousand years. I think of the Pikes Peak region as a cultural crossroads, which is the term we use quite a bit. People have been attracted here and specifically here because of Garden of the Gods and the areas where the plains meet the mountains. Areas like Garden of the Gods provided shelter, they provided game for hunting, they provided water. There's been a tendency in local history to assume or maybe exaggerate that Garden of the Gods was somehow a sacred place, perhaps a burial ground for Native American peoples. Although Garden of the Gods was important in Ute history, its primary importance and significance was as a meeting place and that that meant they would attribute a spirit to it but not all of the imaginings that had been put in their mouths and minds by others. American Indians have been moving up and down the front range of the Rockies since time immemorial. And certainly places like Garden of the Gods were very special to American Indian people. We know that because of the archaeology that we find there, the evidence of habitation, the, uh, the teepee rings, the petroglyphs uh, etched into the face of the rocks at Garden of the Gods. And we know historically that the Ute people used Garden of the Gods as a camping place. It was along one of the major Ute trails that crossed from the western slope of the Rockies onto the plains. It was near Manitou Springs, which was a place of huge cultural significance to the Ute people. The Garden of the Gods was just a landmark for people to come together. It was a place for tribes to see and be seen. The earliest history of Garden of the Gods would be Native American and unwritten. The earliest written would be Spanish and then Yankee American explorers in the area. There have been many different flags that have flown over the area. One of them is the Spanish colonial flag, another is the French flag. Uh, so it's an area that has changed hands many different times. We know that Spanish colonial soldiers were marching right through the region in the 1770s. They traveled you know, immediately south of Garden of the Gods as part of an exploration party looking for Comanches that were living in the area. Probably the most famous is De Anza, who was coming north from the settlements in Santa Fe in order to conquer the Comanches. And not far from Colorado Springs, killed Cuerno Verde Greenhorn, the chief of the Comanches. But that was an expedition primarily to see the limits of Spanish territory and to conduct warfare rather than to take an interest in the scenery. When many of these explorers, whether that's Pike in 1806 or the Long Expedition in the 1820s or Fremont following in the 1840s, what they were trying to do is to gain an understanding and create a map of the American West. So when Pike, the first 
American official to come uh, to this part of the country. Uh, when he left St. Louis in 1806, he literally locked off the map. There were no reliable maps of this area. And so all of these exploration parties coming through were helping us to understand the identity of this part of the world. The 1858-1859 gold rush, often referred to as the Pikes Peak Gold Rush, is what drives then the permanent settlement of the region. Colorado City came into being for a very simple reason. Gold had been discovered up in the Terry Old diggings of South Park, and the easiest way to get to South Park from the Front Range was through U Pass, but the closest towns were Denver and Pueblo. There was nothing out there. And as soon as gold fever struck the, the eastern part of the country in 1859, large wagon trains and individual miners, prospectors, adventurers started coming out here. But when they got to the base of Ute Pass, they needed supplies, they needed picks and shovels and, and food, and they had none of this. That's when two gentlemen uh, by the name of M.S. Beach and Rufus Porter came down from Denver and staked out Colorado City. But they stopped off at this beautiful Red Rocks Park and went in there and Beach said, boy, this would make a neat beer garden. And Rufus immediately came back and said, this would be a garden fit for the gods. And they thought about that for a minute and said, then let that be its name, Garden of the Gods. So it was named, or at least the name that they named it was stuck in 1858. The gold rush that we know as the Colorado Gold Rush or the Pikes Peak Gold Rush or the Pikes Peak or Bust Gold Rush is 58-59. The people who come are the 59ers, but because the landmark people knew to seek and follow Pikes Peak coming across the middle of the country, that's why it was called the Pikes Peak Gold Rush, that's why they were called the Pikes Peak Goldfields. Word of success of discovery of gold in 1858 then kicks off uh, the gold rush, which brings approximately 100,000 people in 1859, and they begin heading to the Pikes Peak region. Oh, Colorado City as we know it today started promoting Garden of the Gods as a major attraction as soon as it was founded by that handful of individuals who were already sounding like a chamber of commerce. Colorado City faced difficulty in attracting permanent residents, and so by the late 1860s, the total population in El Paso County was, according to one source at least, about 80 people. So it was very difficult for the residents in El Paso County to make a go of it during and immediately after the Civil War. That's when General William Jackson Palmer came to the area as he was working for the Kansas and Pacific Railroad. He wrote a letter to his fiancée, Queen. His direct quote is, near here are the finest springs of soda and the most enticing scenery. I'm sure there'll be a famous resort town here once the railroad reaches Denver. Fountain Colony was founded by William Jackson Palmer and the Colorado Springs Company in 1871. Palmer had come here a couple years before and been overwhelmingly impressed with the scenery and the whole site thinking of things far in advance that he actually would carry out. He knew that to get the precious metals out of the mountains, they were going to have to have trains that could take tight corners and also make uh, steep grades. So he started a railroad south out of Denver, and it was his policy to bypass any regular towns and build his own town two or three miles away so he would have the land rights and could sell the lots and make money for his railroads. He wanted to attract investors from Europe and particularly from England and Colorado Springs very quickly got the name of, of Little London. William Jackson Palmer was first and foremost a railroad booster. His job was to build railroads, but he was also interested in the amenities that would attract people to buy a ticket on his trains. So places like Garden of the Gods represented a potential gold mine for, for developers like Palmer because this was a place that he could advertise as a scenic wonder to tourists and potential investors. And Palmer was notorious for building railroad terminuses 
outside of existing settlements. Colorado Springs absolutely eclipsed Colorado City because of the arrival of the railroad. Railroad traffic is really meant the economic life or death for most Colorado cities in the 1870s and 80s. He purchased more of Garden of the Gods area when he was trying to make sure he had the water rights so he could have an irrigation system built through his canyon. But he always thought that it should be preserved. He was very oriented toward preserving the scenery and parks. Interestingly enough, though, he'd never lived here. His home, his estate, was at Glen Erie, just north of Garden of the Gods. He always had an interest in Garden of the Gods. He later purchased part of what we now know as Rockledge Ranch for a home for a family member there. And he also helped to attract another railroad magnate, Charles Elliott Perkins. One of General Palmer's railroad tycoon friends was Charles Perkins. They had a lot in common. Charles Perkins was not only a railroad developer, but he and Palmer shared some elements of an ethic about how to do that. They did not like to associate with monopolizers who would buy up multiple railroads. Also, Palmer, I think, respected Perkins and wanted Perkins to be entrusted with the land that he saw as so special because it was Garden of the Gods. Palmer and Perkins, they, they were sharp businessmen, but they also wanted to give something back. Ultimately, the Perkins family, after Charles Eliot passes away, donates the Central Garden to the city with intent of it becoming a park. Charles Perkins never wrote it in a will, but he did tell his children that all the time, right up to the day he died. So they honored his verbal request and gave uh, that part of the Garden of the Gods that he owned to the city. The Central Garden, about 480 acres, is donated uh, by the Perkins family. That creates the initial park. It's dedicated in 1909. When the Perkins family gave it, um, one of the things was it be forever free to the world. And that was one of the problems of maintaining it because you couldn't charge a fee to go into a city park. After that, the city, over the years, began to add pieces to it. When the city bought their first section of it, it was very small. They didn't even own the balanced rock or steamboat rock that was privately owned. It was behind a fence. If you wanted to get in, you had to pay admission. The balanced rock was owned by a photographer named Paul Gerke, and his sons later owned it as well. If you wanted to go visit balanced rock, you had to agree to have him take a photo of you. You would pay him for that photo. I think it was a quarter a piece at one point. And that was just part of the um, experience. And there were many different groups or individuals that came in and purchased the land to try to create economic activity there. One of the famous ones was Fatty Rice, who created a beer hall near Gateway Rock. A couple of attempts at a beer garden or a beer hall, a lemonade stand, an early kind of resort, fireworks demonstrations, anything that might attract people out there to spend a little bit of money. It made sense. People came there. It's not anything different from what happens at any kind of tourist attraction. In fact, if anything, it's remarkable and wonderful that Garden of the Gods did not get heavily commercialized by major business ventures because that could have damaged the natural features more. During the 1930s, the New Deal agencies of the Franklin Roosevelt administration did come and do work here in Colorado Springs in the region. For Garden of the Gods, the Civilian Conservation Corps came in and planted juniper trees to prevent erosion, created sort of natural stairways to reach different locations, down and up, benches, things that would make public access easier without damaging the environment. The park has, uh, uh, certainly since uh, the late 50s, early 60s, had chuck wagon dinners. And they were not far from the entrance to the park now. And the JCs would do the cooking and 
volunteers, husbands and wives, kids would come out and help serve the dinners. And I first became acquainted with that when I would help serve. In the late 60s or 70s, there were Easter sunrise services held in the Garden of the Gods. And uh, I was a police officer at the time, so we had to go out and direct traffic. And they would gather in the property just to the west of where the kissing camels are. Usually there were probably 10,000 or more people would come to these sunrise services every year. And it was at four o'clock in the morning. Hidden Inn, for example, was a beautiful little quaint three-story building built almost right in a hillside and hidden by cliffs. You had to look straight at it to even see it. But it contained a curio shop on two floors and it had a restaurant up on top. It was a development, but it helped the tourists. It was probably in the late 70s, I guess, when we realized that you can't manage a park site that draws this kind of visitation without having some decent planning. And as people began to pay more attention and more land became available to add to the park, they began to realize the damage that was being done by buses to the rock formations, that we were losing some of the wildlife that we'd had before, and we needed to make uh, some changes. They decided that we've got too much development in here, even though it's helping the tourists, so we're gonna have to get rid of it. They tore down the hidden inn, they got rid of the chuck wagon site, and that's when Lida Hill came along. I was out hiking one day, and I was hiking through the garden, and the, the, the hiking trail just, uh, it, it, was not a, it was not a good trail, it, it really needed work. And I had met the head of the parks department, so I called and said, your Garden of the Gods Park really needs a lot of help. And she said, well, with the money we have, this is what we can do. I got to thinking, there's two million people that want to go see this place. They need something to drink. They want to buy a postcard. Some of them need a cap or a t-shirt. So I put my business hat on, and so I called them. And so I said, well, now, if something outside the park was um, done, would that be workable? Oh, yeah, that'd be fine. So a big master plan was started. Elida said, I'll build this. I'll build it on my land. I will give this to the city. Well, how could you, how could you pass up anything like that? It was a gateway project, kept the parking out of the park, made the parking lot available to the people who want to use the garden, and it's, it's worked out beautifully. About 18 years after we, we opened and the visitor center was doing fine and standing on its own, I donated the visitor center to the Garden of the Gods Foundation. In the first 20 years of the existence of the Visitor Center, we were able to return $2.3 million to maintain the park. This park, by virtue of having the foundation, at least has a guaranteed funding source. And this really is one of the best examples in the country that I'm aware of. It would not be the same park without that public-private partnership that we've established over the past two decades. Today, the city of Colorado Springs has over 1,300 acres of land that are occupied by these amazing rock formations. And it came through the generosity of donors like Lida Hill and others who understood the value of this public amenity and added to it and enhanced it in, in order to make it as spectacular as possible. We've been blessed as a community to have some wonderful resources. And even more blessed today, now that Garden of the Gods Park was ranked number one in the country by TripAdvisor. It is certainly a major driver for tourism. It is one of the amenities that we offer to people who come to Pikes Peak Region either for business or for pleasure. The most current statistic says that about 2.5 million people visit the garden every year. There are endless things that people can do when they visit Garden of the Gods. Hiking is the main thing. Horseback riding is available on certain trails, the nature talks that are led, and um, then the rock climbing. Segwaying through the garden, I tell you, that is fantastic. Let's get modern, folks. We want visitors to have a chance to experience nature as nature intends it. The landscape that we live in really shapes who we are and, and we shape it in return. And places like Garden of the Gods reminds us of how lucky we are to live in such a wonderful place. 
It's a city park. It's ours. It's not a federal park. It's not a state park. And I would challenge any other city in the country to be able to put up a park that equals what we have in Garden of the Gods. I would hope that 200 years from now that it would be treated and enjoyed just like it is now. It's to realize that something so natural and so special occasioned so much concern that rich men who could have developed it wanted it to stay the way it was and wanted to give it to the city and the city wanted to have it and it remained a public park. That gives me goosebumps. How easy would it have been for Perkins family to sell that land off for trophy homes today? You can easily imagine big mansions tucked in the rocks, but that's not what happened. They wanted to make sure that we could all enjoy it to this day. So now more than a century later, we can still all go to Garden of the Gods and enjoy this amazing place in Colorado.